You're too close to that. Get out, please. Okay. It doesn't matter because you never see light. It can't show you light by showing it off. Does it? Is there any other more questions? Is there any more questions? <laughs> no, we're all done. You did your job. Just more questions. I need more questions. 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 Okay. You back, 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 back. Okay. Pinky closer. Okay. Bill Rogers never met her. My favorite dog is a pug dog. My favorite cat is Frankie. I usually call him Frankie Stein. My favorite baby is Baby Jerry, my brother. And my favorite daddy is Danny Cockaden. Now I'm going to present him right on the stage. Come on, Daddy. <laughs> come on, Danny. Come on. Thank you, thank you very much.
very bad. No.
one of these is coming back to the bat. I'm sure it's you know, the sort of thing that I'm saying about that. He doesn't feel like he had a job. I'm going to always put all the stuff first. I really don't. When you're in this type of a situation, I don't to be talking about but it, it's not what you really want to talk about. I just want to talk about specific issues of that. I'll wait maybe five or ten minutes until so we get started. Because you know, we said, you know, this is about 30, you know, not down. And we'll get started. Uh -huh. that. But, you know, I see that all the time. It's not uh, it's not uh, and to me, that goes back to the whole concept. The government should be there trying to create specific government type of jobs. I can't share. Yeah. Put that money. Uh, it shouldn't be put that money. It shouldn't be put that money. It should be put that money. It should be this type time where they can turn around and prosper. And then they create private jobs that not only uh, keep those things done, but that person also gets a raise to hire somebody else when they make some money. Well, it's like our solar commission here. To me, they should hire as many local contractors as possible before they can go out in Vegas. That we're the ones going to help. They, they might want to help the local economy as much as they can. Maybe they go seek outside where they Are they open enough to bid for the local contractors? Oh, yeah, they have one. This, this, this company that out of Clark County was bidding on the Dallas project, they didn't even get a chance to bid. Is that amazing? What did you mean? I mean, that's the next problem. I mean, that's the next problem with these government jobs. It takes you to go to all the stuff. It's going to be here. This is too much. Here we go. I believe that uh, our U.S. Senator hasn't spent the time to come out and listen to the people of the state and understand their concerns and what they really want from them. So I felt it was very important for me 
but I hope to be in his place in November uh, to be able to, uh, to meet with you and hear your concerns. I grew up in Southern Nevada. I went to college at UNLV. I married my wife and raised my children here. I, I've, I've operated three different businesses, first in a law firm, because I'm an attorney by education and practice law for a number of years, and now I run a, a commercial uh, development project, uh, which is struggling like all the other small businesses, and I also have a nonprofit group called the Tarkadian Basketball Academy. I understand what the people in Nevada are going through right now. I've lived here for so long. I've lived through the prosperity, and I'm living through uh, really the struggles that we're having right now. I understand the concerns that we have for our children that are going to be raised here and what our government is, is burdens are placing on our children. I believe what, what, what has been going on this past uh, 13 months has been nothing but frightening for our country. We have a government that uh, we, we, we definitely have problems. We all understand that our economy is in shambles. Uh, it, it wasn't all created by uh, the Democrat Party. Uh, it, there's a lot of blame to go around. But what you need to understand is what is the best approach to get out of it, this, this uh, economic crisis that we've been in? And myself and Senator Reed, we have just a completely different set of opinion. Senator Reed thinks that there is a problem with our economy or anything else uh, in, in our country. we got to get the government more involved in solving that problem. We need to spend more government money and have government tell us how to get out of it and control how we get out of it. He doesn't trust us as individuals to make the right choices. And I really disagree with that. I think. I, one of the great things about our country is it's founded on the principles of individual responsibility and individual liberties. We are given the opportunity to take and choose what we want to do, and then we have to be responsible when those things go good or when they go bad. And that the government is not the best person to answer these questions. It's, an, it's, it's, it's us as individuals. We have a problem in the financial industry. We had to do something to resolve it. The worst thing to do was to get the government to spend a trillion, a trillion dollars to give it to banks without any conditions, and say, okay, now uh, uh, we're going to get more involved in the financial industry. Then they said, okay, we have a problem in the insurance industry. we got businesses that uh, companies are too big to fail. We're going to spend another $100 billion to save the IG. Then, then our government says, you know what? We have a problem uh, with the auto industry. Let's spend $50 to $100 billion in the auto industry. Well, you know, we have problems in all industries. How does the government get involved in and say that, 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 that uh, this industry is more important, the auto industry, than let's say the construction industry, the gaming industry, the industries that are affecting us here in Nevada. You can't have a government pick and choose what the government fish is still the most important at the detriment of other companies and, and, and uh, businesses. Once you do that, you just have anarchy. You have 50 states uh, with citizens paying taxes, and you have elected officials pick and choose what private companies are going to survive and not survive. We have created a mess in our country, and, and, and the longer we head this direction, the worse we're getting. And that takes us to the healthcare. Uh, we have problems with the healthcare uh, 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 situation. I'll be happy to discuss my proposals with you, which I came out with back in August. You know, we like to say that uh, the Republican Party is a party of no, but he, he's the one who refused to come out and meet with people in August and discuss the healthcare care plan, and he's chose to do everything behind closed doors. I had an open uh, healthcare. Uh, town hall in Las Vegas. In fact, Harry had his own uh, uh, email blast to his supporters to come out and try to trip me up. But we talked about common sense proposals and it, uh, based upon the, the free market uh, uh, situation, and, uh, and uh, uh, we had a nice civil discourse. I think people left with an understanding that Reed's proposal wasn't the right way to go. But uh, the, the, what we have here is we have a government that's getting more intrusive, a government that's spending more of our dollars, and we're losing the focus of what's made us a great society. I think it's hard to argue that America hasn't been the greatest economic success story of any country in the history of mankind. And we're going away from those principles to a socialistic type of principle that that is the answer and more government spending is a problem and the solution. While we're doing that, all these socialistic companies are now getting more and more, uh, uh, trying to get more and more towards our society, the capitalistic society. In fact, I had a nice write over here with a reporter from the New Journal. And she was saying how Egypt now is, is getting is trying to turn more of their economy over to the private sector, and, and that's where they're having their most success. Why would we leave the area that has been most successful for us? But the rest of the world is trying to emulate, and we're going away from that to to a government society that has failed in all these other countries. The answer it just it just isn't an answer to it. 
I, mean, I, 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 I think the most important issue for the people here and around the state is jobs and economy and how we're going to turn that around. And I believe that we have to go back and, and I hate to use the word invest because it doesn't cost you, uh, it doesn't cost the taxpayer dollars to, to, to work within the private sector and get the private sector turned around. We're going through some tough times. We have to lessen the burden on the private businesses. We have to reduce the taxes that they're paying right now so they can be more competitive. Our corporations have one of the highest corporate rates in the whole world and all will compete internationally with other companies that have the, such as low ones and that we are at such a disadvantage. We impose all these onerous burdens on our businesses where we can't get uh, bit, uh, new projects out of the ground for upwards to 10 years and when they do there's millions and millions of dollars expended just to get started and other com uh, countries around the world don't have those same uh, burdens and regulations. How do we expect the American workers, who I believe the greatest entrepreneurial spirit are right here in America, but how can we expect them to compete internationally when we're tying their hands behind their back? My solution to the jobs uh, problem is we need to get go back to the private sector and, and, and work with the private sector to create jobs, and we can do that with tax breaks. We can do that with uh, uh, lessening these burdens and regulations. We could do that with getting creative here in Nevada uh, and bringing new businesses in here. I have, and, and, using some of the BLM land and the, the private land that's out there. I'm going to come, uh, um, disclose and make public in about a week our economic plan. And if you're on our email list, I'll send you a copy of this so you'll see. But some creative ways to bring more businesses into the state. See, we could create jobs uh, in two different ways. We have businesses that were here that either close down or they, they reduce their workforce. We need to help them get back so they can start running on full throttle. The second area is to bring in more businesses into the state through diversification. I'm going to talk about that more with my economic plan and we'll uh, turn that over. This other area is uh, with respect to Yucca Mountain, and I, and I know that for some people around the state it's a very important issue and it's something that distinguishes myself from not only Harry Reid but the other primary opponents. See, I believe we've already spent tens of billions of dollars uh, in Yucca Mountain and, and um, we have a, a, a use for Yucca Mountain that could be purely beneficial for, people, for us here in Nevada if we do it. We turned out the mountain into nuclear work, reprocessing facility like they do in France and other countries. We could reprocess a nuclear spent fuel upwards of 95% like they do in France. You're going to create thousands of jobs in Yucca Mountain. You know, Harry Reese is bragging how he closed Yucca Mountain and we've lost hundreds of jobs. And I go throughout the state and I talk to people that have lost their jobs because they closed Yucca Mountain down. Let's utilize, utilize Yucca Mountain to our benefit. Create hundreds of thousands of dollars in tax revenue. Turn UNLV and UNR into the leading research institution of the whole world. It's a win-win situation. There's already uh, nuclear fuel being transported on highways, and there hasn't been an accident uh, on the highways yet. The last nuclear accident was in the late 70s. We've got to be uh, better uh, uh, protections for our, uh, with respect to this transportation. There isn't the risk that we want you to believe. And there's a great opportunity for our state to not only create more jobs, but get out of our budget mess, which we're in right now. And for you that, that, that uh, are watching uh, what's happening in Carson City, uh, they're going to go to special session. Again, I think it's the fourth time now where they're going to have to reduce another $800 million uh, from our budget uh, with, with cuts. So let's find a solution to all this. And those are some of mine. What I'd like to do now is, is, is listen more to what you guys have to say. If you have any questions for me, I'll give you my opinion on things. But what I think you will see from me is I want to be responsive to you as, as a public servant. I'm not running as a politician. I'm not running to move up the leadership ladder so I can be more powerful. I want to, I want to, I want to listen to you, see what, what you guys want, and I want to go back to Washington and do what's best for you as, as, as individuals and for what's best for the state of Nevada and the country. And to do that, you understand where you're coming from. So any questions, Some things you want to ask me? I'd like to say I really, really like your hearing on the economic. I think it's a, a, a project that we've already spent billions of dollars creating. And like you said, it, it, they're coming up with ways now to reprocess um, the, um, uh, the nuclear waste and actually be able to resell it. They're doing it right now in France, 95% of it. Yeah. We actually, uh, Carter had passed a lot of ban that here in our country in the late 70s, and we need to, we need to change that. Yeah, I think it. Um, we should do just like Alaska does with the pipelines. Um, even pay the residents of Nevada a certain amount on their taxes each year, give them you know, a lump sum each year for us having it in the state. But I'm like you, I think it would be very possible for the state of Nevada. Okay. 
about the transportation of nuclear waste. Do you think they're able to wage the orders to bring in the trucks? Well, right now they're bringing in the trucks on highways, and they have uh, they have uh, studies that have shown how protective it is. That even if there was the truck did fall over, there would be a, a nuclear uh, uh, reaction. Uh, whether it's on trucks or on the highway, uh, as long as we are um, have shown that it, it is it is uh, as safe as can possibly be, then then let's do that. Uh, again, if you do it on it, it, one thing is there's a lot of uh, uh, business available for the rail right now. There's railroad uh, companies that have a hard time um, uh, utilizing the assets and the resources they have, and that would be a good way to do it. Anything else? Well, we, you know, the other thing is that we're, we're in rural Nevada, and that's our livelihood comes from uh, mining and ranch, and that's all important to us. Even in Tampa, we have a lot of mining. And of course, the ranch is a little further out, but the entire state is in that. Way. I think that's where Harry's had a lot of problems. That he forgot about the rules about 10 years ago, and I know when they had the, and I, I understand the coal fire uh, plants, power plants that was proposed in Ely with 1,200. Uh, Construction workforce was turned down, and these people were upset. And I understand they're upset because you know, the economy was bad. They needed new jobs. And we needed the energy. And we needed the energy. And so, you know, it just seems like it was, it was all done too quick and was stopped too fast. But, yeah, and that's it's interesting because Green's taken the, the uh, posture uh, publicly that he's going to create all these new jobs, these energy jobs. And those are great. You know, when we get to the point that we can utilize green energy, I'm sure we're all in favor of that. But if we're years away from getting this thing up and running and, and creating all these jobs, the people in Nevada need the jobs now. What would have been wrong with starting these projects, providing the energy we need, at the same time working to get us better research on these green uh, energy jobs? Well, then when these green energy is, is at a cost-efficient uh, uh, point, we can turn our, our economy over to that. It's really a common sense solution. It's hard to understand why they don't think of these things. One of the obvious things that I, I, it's a little bit uh, skeptical about your, your politicians, and I call them politicians who make these decisions, when you have these special interest groups that are donating tens of thousands of dollars to these politicians, and you wonder if maybe uh, they got, uh, they, they're the ones that are really making some of these decisions and not uh, your, these politicians. We, we have to go back to what's best for the people of our state and our country and get the special interest out of there. You notice know, reason Brad Boast and is going to raise $25 million to uh, to run for re-election, keep his job like millions of Americans around the country are losing theirs. He's doing that with money from all these special interest groups. Very little bit, a very small portion of that's come from the people in Nevada, and those have all been large contributions. You know, I'm not going to have anywhere close to the money Reed has, but I've had over 10,000 people contribute to my campaign already. 10,000 people around the country. I bet you that's more than Harry Reed has. So, uh, well, you know, we have the bad news the special interest groups. Uh, Sierra Clubbers, et cetera, have come out and they're picking up these properties, these small ranches around the state of Nevada, and they do a big, a big trade-off. They, you know, they work with BLM. They trade them. They either buy them with cash. The bad thing about them is when they buy these properties, there's a couple between here and all states. They pass one when you're going back just before you get paid. Uh, the nights are place. But when they, they bought it, and it was a working ranch, and the people would use it to maintain it. Now, it's got a gate on it. There's a gate with a big lock on it. And they haven't, and the places it's deteriorated and gone to hell. Yeah. And here was a ranch that was working, and, and it's gone now because they, it's a special interest group. The same thing with our elk herds and stuff. They've been buying a lot of those, those places that have elk habitat, and they're trying to stop some of the special interest groups from buying these and getting these big bucks to buy these ranches. Not only that, you got the Forest Service bought the bird ranch up here. Yeah, that was another It was another working ranch. The gates were closed on their extent. Now it's closed down. Why is the, the government? Why government? What, what, what business have they got buying a ranch? They just locked the gates and put a padlock around the way to go back into Yeah, it's a shame that it's they crazy. buy these places and just shut them down. <coughs> the federal government is owned the, in the high ends of the 80 some percent of the land here in the Nevada. And instead of going the other way and reducing the ownership of that land, they're, they're buying more up and taking up more ownership. And again, it's hurting us with jobs. The proposal that we're going to come out with with our economic plan is we're going to, we're going to require the federal government to release this land back to the states. Let the states utilize this to create new jobs and new industries for, for the people of Nevada. Yeah, there's no reason the federal government should own 90 percent of our state. Well, another suggestion I'd like to make is, is as far as mine, they put a moratorium on the patents uh, years ago. 
<clears throat> and I see the reason because the government is uh, letting these big companies come in and stake thousands of planes and they're selling for real estate. My theory is now, though, for the, for the small miner status, you're going to have 10 claims or less in the state of Nevada or anywhere, it gets to be small miner. Why don't they allow these small miners to end up getting patents, which it has nothing to do with the big stake of all these claims, but they eliminate me dealing with BLM every day of the life. It's just crazy. Yeah. They, they just they, they run a road race through here, the paperwork's that thick on their study. Not, I asked them if any one of them had read it, they said no. I mean, how could they? I, I agree with that. <coughs> well, and, that, and that's where you talk about the government. Um, they talk about all of these creating jobs and, and um, uh, developing our natural resources and all this and that. Well, because of the government red tape, that's what holds these projects up. The mining industry, it holds up uh, the mining activities, it holds up the green um, uh, And it solar. creates more jobs for them because they just make more exactly. paperwork and change the rules every year. And they spend more money to pay for that. Mm -hmm. I was told, and i got to get the exact figure, that China's going to build 76 new nuclear plants in the next 10 years. It would take us, if we started right now, 10 years to get one pass to all the government regulations. 10 years just to get a pass. How do they expect us to compete with other companies when they do that? Yeah. And then you know what amazes me is, they, uh, again, I think it was a wrong thing to pass that stimulus package. And, and, and certainly it was wrong that we're 49 out of 50 states with the money. But then we have these projects and we were talking about this. We bring a project, and I'm going to give the one that I heard of in my last week of brief that's being done in Dallas Air Force Base. It's a Las Vegas company. In fact, uh, one of the DBA companies, small business uh, minority groups, had bidded on projects in uh, Dallas and, uh, for years and years and years. And they didn't want to even give them the opportunity to bid on the project. They gave it to a company either out of Utah or Idaho, from a state outside of Nevada. So, you know, they're going to tax us. They're going to, they're going to raise our, our, our deficit where someone's going to be paying a, uh, all these trillions of dollars. And they say it's going to come back and help spur economic activity here for us in Nevada. And Nevada project doesn't even go to a Nevada company. And there's a lot of problems with that. All that taxpayer fraud. <laughs> I guess I uh, taxpayer fraud. They're certainly uh, misleading us in what they think, what, what they're doing, from what they're saying. People don't want us to see the health bill shut down. Yeah, that's great. I want to talk about the health health bill for a second because it's such an easy compare and contrast. We have a problem with the skyrocketing health care costs, and we also have a problem with existing conditions. We understand that, and there are a number of people that want health care that can't get it. Not the 30 million that they want to propose, more closer to 5 to 9 million, okay? But what, what Harry Reid has decided to do, now first of all, let's just look at this way. If this was a good bill, why is he doing it behind closed doors? Why is he having to pass it on Christmas Eve? And why does he have to bribe senators, several senators, uh, with, with, with such uh, really unconstitutional provisions just to get it passed if it was so good? What does this bill create? It creates upwards of 70 plus federal agencies that are going to determine, get more involved in a health care decision. It's supposed to cut 500 billion for Medicare. It's going to cost 400 billion more in taxes. Uh, it's, it's going to fine you if you don't have insurance, but then it's going to fine you again if you have too good of insurance. Is that the greatest thing? Well, that's the next thing to say. They're going to fine you if you don't buy insurance, and they're going to fine you again if you buy too good of insurance, unless you're a union member or a federal employee. It's really good if, uh, uh, you know, I guess Harry Reid won't pay you a fine and use that Cadillac plan. Uh, it's not, there's simple solutions. I mean, it's not going to solve all the problems, but I'm going to give you four, solutions, four things we can do that would substantially reduce our health care costs. Won't cost the taxpayers one additional dollar, it's market driven, and, and uh, it will reduce our costs upwards of 50%. We allow people to purchase insurance across state lines like they do with their life insurance and their car insurance. Uh, only our health insurance do we not allow that. What that does is it creates more competition to, to, uh, uh, of uh, providers. And always in our society, you see you create more competition, you get a better product at a lower cost. You know, how, you know what percentage? We have one company who writes seven percent of all insurance premiums here in the state of Nevada, United CA. So our competition is severely lacking. There are so many people that I bet with that have come in from out of state. Many of them, if you can believe it, from California. 
They said, God, I've got to keep my policy I had in California. It's cheaper and providing better service. Why do I got to drop it and get a Nevada policy? The second thing is, and it's been well discussed, is a tort reform. If we cap on economic damages, not only are we reducing the cost for the doctor's medical malpractice, which has been discussed, but more importantly, uh, it's been reported that upwards of 180 to 210 billion dollars a year are spent by doctors to do what they call preventive medicine. Not medicine the doctor feels a patient needs, but what the doctor does so they can prevent having a lawsuit. What a waste of money. The third area is the third area is if we would enforce the federal law that says Medicare has to be the payee of last resort. You realize that 13 percent of all Medicare recipients have private insurance, and the federal government Medicare doesn't force those private insurance companies to pay the, those bills. They get that so much of that slips through where they go. It's, it's easier for Medicare to say, "Well, I'll pay it. I don't want to chase the money down." I mean, those private insurance companies are getting uh, uh, premiums for those policies. Why are we enforcing them to pay that? The fourth area is what they refer to as state mandates. State mandates are contrary to everything our country is based upon. Our country is based upon the fact you go out, you work hard, and with those hard-earned dollars, you go out and you pick and choose what product you want to buy based upon the cost and the benefit, right? State mandates is the state tells you, as a, as a uh, citizen of that state, you have to buy this insurance policy with this coverage in it at this cost, whether you like it or not. There are over 2,000 state mandates around the country. Nevada has one of the highest, but 56. What do you think, the, what, what percentage do you think the state mandates make up of the insurance premiums? Just give me a guess, I'll be late. Anybody? 20 to 50 percent of your insurance premium goes on state mandates. Nevada's closer to 50 percent. If you just eliminate, or at least substantially reduce them to only the vital ones, you would save upwards to 50 percent of insurance costs. Those are four simple solutions that reduce health care costs, not cost the taxpayers one additional dollar. And what do you hear from the Democrats when they discuss this? Pardon? You don't hear anything. You know, again, what it does is it doesn't allow any more control of, the, of government over these, uh, uh, the insurance industry, and that's exactly what they want. With, res with respect to pre-existing conditions and the other problems that we have, the simple solution, and it won't solve all the problems, but it will solve a large a number of them, is to get away from the employer provided plan to an individual owned portable plan. And what I mean by that is, you know, after the World War II, employers started providing insurance to employees because they're trying to uh, compete with people to get them in their jobs. You know, those employers right now that provide insurance, they would just as well, just as easily, and probably would like to provide that money into what you would call a health savings account. A health savings account, the individual employee would own. They can pick and choose what insurance he or she wants based upon the cost and they would own that insurance policy and take it with them from job to job. So if they lose their job, or they, become or, they go to, or they go to another job, they still have that insurance policy in place and not dropped. A, lot, a, a major problem with the pre-existing condition is when you get dropped, you lose your insurance because you lose your job. When you try to go to a new insurance company, they won't insure you because of this. Well, if you already own your plan, you're going to keep the plan, and they're going to keep it, and they're not going to, uh, they don't drop you, and that would solve a big problem. Why don't we have more individual plans? It's really, and you never hear this from, from these discussions. We give a tax break to an employer who provides insurance, insurance for the employee, but we don't give any tax break to an individual sole proprietor who wants to buy insurance for themselves, or someone who's not even an employee but wants to buy it for themselves. They don't get a tax break. Why? Why would you give the individual who wants to buy insurance? If you really want to encourage more ownership in the insurance plans, why not provide the same tax break? You don't hear that in any of these discussions. Instead, we talk about the government take over the plan, $2.4 trillion over 10 years. Uh, if the plan was so great, why are they not implementing it after the 2012 election? Um, there's a lot of a lot of things that would be nice to have answers from, but these discussions are all done under, behind closed doors. I yes. have a question. Um, you're saying here in your brochure that uh, you want to create world-class schools and universities for children. Um, how come the battle ranks so low in education? You know, our kids are like way at the bottom of the scale. Yeah, I, well, what? You, you state facts. The question is, how do you, how solve, you, fix how you solve that problem? What, is, what, what, has created, what, what creates a better product here in our society? Over the years, what, what has always created a better product? Competition and rewarding people who do better 
and being able to terminate people who don't do that, don't do their job, correct? What do we have in our school system? We have a monopoly with the public school system. They, they, you know, in Arizona right now, they're going out and they're starting, they're, 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 they're getting more and more charter schools in Arizona to compete with the public school system. And those and Arizona's uh, education system is skyrocketing, it's getting better and better because of great competition between, with the public school system, which is forcing the public school system to get better because they're going to lose their kids to the charter school system. Create more competition. And the second thing is we've got to reward people who, I mean, if you are working as a teacher and the person who goes home right after school doesn't do anything and doesn't really care or, or, or doesn't do as good a job with the children compared to some a teacher who's spending, staying late working with kids and, 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 and doing a better job, but why should that person get paid more? But are you going to, how are you going to sell that or are you going to go by? Just like every, just like, no, 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 just like every other job. You have, a, you have an employer, right? And he has employees. He doesn't, I mean, how do, you, how do you determine which employees are doing better? The boss and the employee, the, the employer does. We have a principal of the school. They, they witness what's going on in the school. I'm not into the stand -like standardized testing and saying, well, this standardized test went higher, so therefore this teacher's doing better. But you have somebody who's there every day working with these teachers. They can go in and monitor the class, and it's their job. That's what they're supposed to be there. It's just, and I, I might believe you, my mother and sister are in education. My dad was in education. Education's been a big part of my, my, my family's life. And there's been a, some, some arguments or disagreements on my beliefs and, 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 and some of the things they're saying. But and they're saying, well, the, you know, the principal could be biased. Um, they may not give you a, uh, they may be closer with one person. But that's just like an employer. An employer could be closer uh, with one employer than another and, and, and give them a promotion or a raise. But in reality, if they want to do their best job, that principal better reward the people that are, do, uh, that are doing better and get rid of the ones that aren't. I mean, there has to be a way to get rid of teachers that aren't doing well right now that you need to prevent that. So do you agree with the no child left behind? Well, first of all, there's a lot of as aspects to that, to, that, to that bill. It's not just one simple thing. One of them is standardized testing, which I told you already, I don't think is a fair indication of how well the students are doing. I also believe that education should be controlled by the locality, and the federal government uh, should have less involvement into it. So I think, or, again, I, I believe the localities here, starting with the state and then going down to the counties or the school districts, they should be able to implement what they believe is the best uh, you know, curriculum for those schools, but it should be based upon competition, but they should provide more of a competition to provide a better product and based upon uh, performance. Uh, uh, the pay, the compensation should be based upon performance. Any other questions? Oh, yes. I, I just Thank want to stop in. I'm Joe Fleeney from the Prince Springs Ranch. And um, here, quite a while ago, I was public chairman of the Nevada Cattlemen's Association. And I uh, cornered Harry Reid up in Ely at one of the, one of the cattle ones. He was in Ely? Um, pardon? He was in Ely. Oh, oh yeah, he was in. That's before they were running out of most of the state of Nevada, you know. But, but anyway, uh, the bottom line to this deal was I went over to him and I said, Harry, I says, what about the constitutional issue of this? And he looked at me and he said, oh, that old outdated piece of paper. He says, that old outdated piece of paper, and he walked away from me. Now, if, if you want, so help me God, if you want, if you want me to stand up and do a campaign deal, I'll tell, I'll just swear on the Bible, that's what that guy done. And I couldn't stand him from that day on. Well, you see, you see that's his, his philosophy as you witness what he is trying to push through the legislation right now. Most of this stuff, I believe, is unconstitutional. Let me ask you, and I don't care if you're public or Democrat or independent. As an American, is it fair for our federal government to take taxpayer dollars from all 50 states and say, okay, we believe Merrill Lynch should survive, but Lehman Brothers shouldn't? We believe, so they can pick and choose companies in an industry. Is it fair and is it constitutional? Is it even a better end to get your point? Is it constitutional for the, the federal government to pick and choose which companies should survive or not with our taxpayer dollars? Is it constitutional? Is it fair? Is it right to pick and choose which industries should survive and which ones don't survive? The auto industry, which just happens to have a bunch of union workers that they need to vote for them, we're going to put the money in so they can survive. But we have a construction industry that's decimated here in Nevada. We have a gaming industry that's decimated here in Nevada. We have small businesses that are decimated here in Nevada. 
but they're not big enough to survive. So the government's going to pick and choose that. Then you can get to the health care plan. Well, is it, is it constitutional that one state would have all the Medicare payments paid for for eternity by all the other 49 states just because that senator decided he was going to hold out? I mean, you see what he's doing. It, it follows exactly what you said. And believe me, that's why he's on the ropes. He hasn't understood that. And I don't think he's going to understand it. And if he does, it's already too late. Uh, he's right there. We can wave and say, hi, Harry. <laughs> he's his <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> Again, cap and trade. How can you really think about passing cap and trade provisions right now when our economy is in shambles like it is? We're going to tax people and, and businesses for the use of energy, and it's going to make it, it's going to cause more businesses to go on and create more unemployment. You know what's interesting about uh, Obama's uh, speech yesterday? He's always, always a good speaker when he has a teleprompter there. He always does really well. Uh, but think about this now. But think about this now. You know what blew me away? He actually had read a teleprompter when he spoke to an elementary school class. Yeah, this he had two in his grade class. Sixth grade class. Really? Yeah. But anyways, what, what really st stood out for me in that in that uh, in his speech is this. He says we got to get to jobs. Jobs has got to be a main focus. It's the most important thing. Well, that was a year ago. It was the most important thing, and it took him a year to figure it out. Exactly now, what Romney said. That yeah, right. uh, Mitt Romney said that today, but it, it, and so it's so accurate. But the other thing too is okay. So that's the most important thing. Let's concentrate on. And what does he say in his speech? Well, we still got to pass health care with with, with with these provisions. We're going to spend time and resources on that. We're going to pass cap and trade on this. We're going to spend time and resources on that. Hey, we got a serious, serious, serious uh, job problem here. Highest unemployment in the history of the state of Nevada. Worse than the Great Depression. Why are we focusing on those other issues instead of putting all of our focus on those jobs in the economy? If, if Obama really made that his number one priority, he wouldn't be talking about cap and trade, which is going to uh, eliminate more jobs. And not more government jobs. Yeah. yeah no, more more private sector jobs. jobs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, uh, we, could, we can create 100% employment. The government just keep hiring people. We keep printing money. Then when you try to buy something with the dollar, we'll see what you get. Tammy, Joe, and Sue, and their family's been here for almost 100 years. They have, they have fought the government their entire lives. They can give you horror stories about I'm sure some, about things, some things that have happened. I would love to stay in touch with and get some more. And they've survived. It's there, right, Joe? You guys have survived. You know, it's, 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 it's very historic. interesting. You know, we. Over the years, we've sued them. If you count the stages, you know, through this, through this uh, exhausting our administrative procedures, well, we, we've been exhausting our administrative procedures 30 some times, and we won every one of them but one. And the reason we won them is because we was right, you know. And, and it's amazing. Uh, we, 31 we, administrative procedures cost you how much money and how much time, and, and how does that affect your bottom line in being okay. problem survivor? Yeah, it costs us $50,000 to go through the exhaustion administrative procedure for somebody uh, and opposite of us can go down to a federal court and they used to be put down $50 and get to the same spot we was. Now that is not, that is not equal justice. When we have to spend that kind of money and that kind of time to try to back these people off and the people that's on the opposite side of us can go on the same day, put into the federal court and uh, put their feet down and be right where we took us that length of time to get there. Where, where do you stand on the wild horse issue? Yeah, that's a good question because it's such a uh, um, passionate issue right now. Obviously, we have to do something to reel, reel in those the horses. And, um, and, and stop the problems that the ranchers and um, um, the farmers or well, the ranchers are having in the state with the with their feet. Okay, but we need to do it in a humane way. And I don't know. You hear both sides. I've been getting emails on both sides about how horrendous this is, and I get emails how it's not. And I'm actually going to go, uh, or we're going to try to, why we would found it to go see uh, the round that they have there, so I can have a first um, hand witness of what it is. I sure would rather have a first-hand view of what's happening as opposed to just speaking out what people need help on. Would you, would you be able to consider bringing slaughterhouses back into the United States? Slaughtering the horses? No, just having, now they're banned in the United States. Even Anson voted for that, and he's a veterinarian. But, you know, I mean, it's a big, it's a big part of, of this wild horse problem and domestic horses. People, 
you know, we if we get a sick horse or a broken leg, we just go out there and pop it in the head and dig a hole and plant. But people in the city, it's costing them six, seven hundred dollars to have their domestic horses put down because there's no slaughterhouses left. I don't understand that issue well enough. I certainly will look forward to learning it better. You know, one thing I learned, uh, uh, or try to do since I've been campaigning, is you can't expect someone to come in here and have knowledge of every single issue that's out there. I uh, feel better when I can just say, listen, that's a, I can understand it's an important issue to you. I'll do my best to look up, look into it, and, and have an answer for you next time. Okay, thank you. Well, a lot of, these guys have documented areas that, that the reason they're taking the horses off the land is because it's overpopulated. Yep. And they have too many horses, and they've got to eliminate some of them. Uh, and they, and that's, that's what you're going to hear a lot of. But the special interest groups and the Sierra Clubbers and uh, Wild Horse Andy and that bunch, they're trying to stop it completely. They're always, they're always there trying to stop it. If they, they take them to court, they have the money behind them, and it's really hard for, the, for them to, to get the ground horses out. They've got to keep control they got to control them. they got to keep the sick, the old, the crippled. They're so interbred now, their their brains are probably the size of the teeth. That's honestly got to There is no such thing as the original mustard. They're gone. I, I just know this is a very passionate issue because I've been getting to little emails on it. And uh, that lady encouraged me to go and you know, watch what's happening in town. And, uh, you know, hopefully I'll have a better answer for you. Well, once again, once again, another program yeah. that the government stepped into. Now it's costing billions of dollars. When if they did, jobs. Yeah, three. You know, but if they'd have left them alone years ago, the ranchers used to maintain the herds. They used to keep them healthy. They used to keep them, um, uh, you know, from interbreeding. They turned good size, and then they used the horses. They 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 dog fooded the ones that, that couldn't survive on the range, and, and um, uh, used, the, used the other ones. Yeah. yeah, and that once again, is good. once the government purpose. steps in, you know, now we have this humongous, humongous. Uh, program that costs billions of dollars and is, isn't um, really working with and, and that goes back to you know, my general philosophy as a, 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 what I want to be as a public servant is I believe our government was created for a limited and few specific purposes. And we should do those things great. We shouldn't be trying to have government solve all the social ills. When my dad was a basketball coach, he used to say he wanted his team to do one or two things and do them great. And he let them play against a team to try to do five or six things because they can't do anything very well. We have a government now that is not focusing on, and there's different things that the federal government should do in the state and the county, but they're limited, specific purpose. Instead of focusing on those areas and doing them great, we're trying to solve all the social ills, and we're not doing anything very well. Yeah, they're looking at buying means of uh, uh, private acres now to turn all these wild horses out. Okay, another thing I'd like to touch on, you know, we're sitting here in a free, independent, sovereign state. <coughs> You know, and uh, and the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service, uh, everything that used to build up our economy, like the mining claims, there used to be a hundred dollar deal on it that you went out and done the work for a hundred dollars, and that created quite an economy all over the state. You know, and now we have the federal government coming in, taking all of our money. They sell the land in Las Vegas. How much money do we get out of that land in Las Vegas? You know, um, if they're claiming, you know, they was they was actually uh, an executor of the land of the United States, and then they turned around and then on on the on the one act they changed it from the executor to they're the ownership of it. Now, if they are the ownership on it, let's put that on the tax roll and let's get some money out of those people. That's a great point. Uh, no, I'm serious. If they own it, we pay taxes on what we own. Well, let's put that. Let's give them a bill um, to get our economy back in shape. Because if they own it, like yeah. that, they ought to pay some taxes. On it. I agree. Just earlier, before you got here, I discussed about the um, 80 some percent, high 80 percent that the federal government owns in Nevada land, and they're buying more of it up. I'm going to come out with an economic proposal where we're going to talk about releasing that federal land back to the state so we can use that to create more jobs and economic diversity. I agree with you. Yeah, they should have. And they should have. We need to in the state that we could use it to productive use and not just have it sit. So, what I say with the money, they let the small miners patent the claims, the money go into the county. You pay taxes on the property, you, you're benefiting somebody. The way it is now, you're just used to it. The money stays in the state, not, right. not out to the federal government.
Yes. Well, this has really been great. You guys have had some great questions. And uh, I'm glad that enough of you tell the story again. We've got the camera. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, we wanted to get it. Right. What, which one? Yeah. The one about the, the Constitution? Yeah. Yeah. But I was public land chairman of the, of the Nevada Cattlemen's Association. And they was having a meeting up in, uh, in uh, Ely, Nevada. And I went over to Harry Reid and I uh, wanted to ask him what about the constitutional issue on some of these uh, programs, you know, why, why isn't it being followed? And he says, oh, that old outdated piece of paper, and he walked away from me. And, and I thought that was unreal. That guy stood up there and he took the oath to uphold that constitution of the United States, and then when I ask him about it, I get that kind of a response. That, that, just mind-boggling to me. So when I started mining over 50 years ago, your total fee was two dollars a claim, which you paid the county uh, treasurer, and there was no federal interference at all. Uh, then the federal government decided that a hundred dollars would be enough, and now it's 140 a claim. My taxes on patent claims are 15 dollars. Why does the federal government, or how can the federal government uh, justify it? Ten times what the going rate is for the same size claim. They want to create more social government programs. Oh, and that, that's, that's their answer. And, and believe me, that's why we are at a crossroads here in this election. It has gotten so bad. And I mean, to one degree, uh, all because we and Obama has done it so fast, it's it's it's, it's magnifying what, what they're trying to accomplish. And they just want to they want to create more government control over everything that we do because they think government has the best answers for our problems. Why I believe that there's a strong movement around our state and our country that we want to put this back in individuals that we as individuals should have, should make those type of decisions because we can do them better than government. And when you go to the polls in November and for you that are voting in the Republican primary in June, you're going to have to go and vote for somebody that you feel will go back and stand for the principles that you believe in. If you think the federal government is uh, an all-powerful okay, so federal so government that <coughs> exhausts the nation's treasury with never-ending spending cuts, catered to all these special interest groups, then you've got to go ahead and vote for Harry Reid. Well, I believe that we, I believe in limited government. I believe in lower taxes. I believe we should have honest regulation and meaningful accountability. And, uh, and, and I, I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I believe we need to go after the terrorists with everything that we have. And uh, and, um, and, if, and if you believe in those, I hope that you'll give, it, give me a chance to represent you. I will go back to Washington, D.C. and try to be the best U.S. Senator the state's ever had. I'll go there and represent the interests of you, the people of the state, and, um, and do the best I possibly can. You may not agree with every position I have. My wife doesn't agree with every position I have either. In fact, probably the majority of them. But, uh, but at least she knows that I'm honest. I will stand by my convictions and, and, and fight for what I believe in. I hope that you'll give me a chance. June 8th is a primary if you're Republican. I certainly hope that you'll vote for me. It's going to be a very tough primary. And the number of people in the race is very close. I am winning the primary right now, but it's, it's very close. It's within two points. I'm winning the general election against Terry Reid, and every single poll that's come out, there's been 12 of them now. Every other outside the margin of error, and I'm the only Republican candidate that can say that. And I'm really reading these polls worse than anybody else in the Republican primary. The last two that came out, the Rasmussen poll a week and a half ago, uh, had me ahead by 14%, the highest anybody's ever led read. And even the liberal daily cost, which is liberal leading, they had me just last week or just the other day, just running together, it might have been just a couple of days ago, they had me ahead by 12%. So my race is going very well. I believe the more I can get out and talk with people and they understand what I stand for, I'm going to get their support. I hope that you guys will give me this chance. And if you do, please go out, talk to your friends. We'd love to have your email or contact information. We'll keep you updated on what's happening in the campaign. And if you have people that you think can get together and have a meet and greet where I can meet you know, 10, 15 people, I'll be coming back to Tonopah many times. I'd love to come by and see, see whatever, meet with whatever group of people you have. I really appreciate it. I know on a Thursday, a Thursday in the middle of the work day, it's so nice to see so many of you out here. I really appreciate the fact that you take your time to come talk with me. If you want to stay extra, I can talk to you. If you got to go, I don't want to keep you all day either. Thank you again.
To vote in the Republican primary, which again is going to be very contested, you have to be registered as a Republican in this state. Some other states that have open primaries where you can vote uh, in that part. I really could use your support in the primary if you so believe in me. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, I'm in Joe's on each other for a while. I'm being bored. I'm a general contractor here in town. We've been fighting over water. Yeah. He has trouble with his water, I have trouble with mine. I got good drinking water, but trying to sell it to down here, sell it to people. We're just like them damn cattle out there on the range. We just poured it and let us die. Right, Joe? Yeah, water's a big issue. Water is yeah. horrible. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's so big, you know, you stop and think about the state of Nevada. What are we setting? 13% of ownership in the three sovereign state of Nevada, yeah. and we own our water. Now, uh, right now, they're trying to change the Clean Water Act and they're tr trying to change one word in it so the federal government will have complete control of the water. And that word is the Navajo waters. The federal government has control of them. And they're trying to change that Clean Water Act to say all the waters. When they get all the waters, that means the state water engineer's office just will pack up and leave because that is the federal government. It's the only thing we own, practically. But, but isn't this again? The same thing I've been talking about, Reed and Obama and, and, and the Democrats' philosophy. The federal government can determine for us yeah, that's what's right. best for us, as opposed to leaving to us. And we, we are at a crossroads. If you believe in the first, then you know, Reed's a guy you should be vote for. I believe the people that are living here in the state that determine the water. They've always taken care of their own stuff. It is, it is, it it is it's property of the state of Nevada, which is transferred to private, like all of our wells, all of our pipelines, all of our springs that we've developed for our cattle, yeah. is our property. In fact, we're, we're kind of a rare ranch because we're a water-based allotment. Most are land-based, and their AUMs are distributed based on that. But we're water-based. Without owning us owning that water that we've developed, we, don't, we can't graze cattle. Right. Well, you have an opportunity to put someone who believes in the state rights completely and fervently in office, give me this chance and... Uh, okay, I, I have one more one more question. Sure. Where do you stand on the Yucca Mountain and the railroad? Oh, we talked about Yucca Mountain, I'll go through that again. No, that's okay. I oh. just want to know where you stand on the railroad, because the damn thing's coming right through the middle of our okay, ramp. That's what you asked about, right. like the transportation of the uh, mm -hmm. other things stuff. I am in favor of turning up around and nuclear reprocessing facilities, so reopening up and having this transportation. The best mode of transportation to get there, I don't have an answer for you right now. Okay. Again, I'll look into it and I will understand the, the issue and give you a better response on it. I firmly believe, though, we have to utilize the Yucca Mountain. We can invest into it. We can turn it into a nuclear reprocessing facility, which would create more nuclear energy. Oh, with that's the a waste, really good idea. With the waste, and we create, out, create thousands of jobs within our, our, our state, hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in revenue, which our state desperately needs. The next issue for me to, to formulate, and I'll do that now that you brought this up, is the best mode of transportation to get here. Well, just reroute it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nuclear waste has been found in our highways now for, for decades. And oh, I know. They already have a road line. Yeah. As they go through 46, 46 miles of our water, went over 17 of them, just exactly over the top of them. And I took them out to ask them about them. About them. All we need to do is run across the test site. About the, yeah. the, the property rights and what comes up is you know we have the power of eminent domain. And that told me right there is like they're just gonna like they've done every time before when they need something. They, that's the reason that went over 17 of our waters, because they needed that water to build a railroad. So they take it. Yep. Yeah. Inverse condemnation. Yeah. <laughs> I've been trying to survive in the winter out there with global warming. Every day I'm struggling with global warming.